I've enjoyed audience. reading your book. It's well it's done. I really love it. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, I have a couple of questions for you, just to give us a little more insight into this. Um, so, um, I just want to start sort of at, at the beginning with Merton Clavette. Um, for those who have not read this book yet, can you share the story of how you came to learn of Morton Clavet and how a, vandali a, a vandalism headline in the Louisville <laughs> Courier Journal led you to his family. Yeah, so the um, I was I was reading old newspapers because that was a thing I do. I just read them from a hundred years ago today, and uh, there are all kinds of databases where you can find that. And it just so happened that one of the headlines was "Vandal Shoots Painting." I think is what it was from. 1922. And I, I mean, when I was going through the newspapers and just kind of looking at the listing, I was just grabbing the ones that happened to grab my attention. And vandals were a thing apparently that were out and about in the 20s. Um, and um, there were all kinds of these stories about vandals um, attacking people. And bandits was one of the words. Bandits, yeah. bandits and vandals. Yeah. Um, they stole somebody's engagement ring at one point. And so, so anyway, I was, I was really curious what painting would prompt somebody to shoot at it. Um, and so I read the article and the article described it and, um, it described it as Woodrow Wilson's head on a platter with a dark arm around it and a stormy sea. And I was trying to picture it, and I was having a really hard time imagining what that looked like. Um, I realized I didn't know what Woodrow Wilson looked like either, so I had to, <laughs> had to look that up. Um, but in there, it talked about um, the reporter communicated with the person who owned the shop, and the shopkeeper was also the artist, which was Merton Clavette. And I was like, I have never heard of anybody named Merton, and I've never heard of the Clavette name, so I'm... I'm kind of curious. Um, and I started trying to look around to see what I could find out about this. And I struck out a bunch. Um, I did find that there were, um, uh, when you had a, um, an exhibition um, for art, they would have a, um, a brochure, you know, that would come out, that would show you all the paintings and that kind of thing. And you could choose whether you wanted to have an image of your painting in there or not but you had to pay for it so like the free listing was just title author and then if you wanted to take a whole page then you paid i think it was like a dollar uh to have it in there um but then people who wanted to go to the exhibition would be able to open the brochure and look at it and see paintings and figure out what they wanted to buy or um or not that kind of thing um and so i found because the article mentioned what ex exhibition this painting had been in and they had caused quite the stir. Um, and so I went back to, I was through archive.org. Um, I dug around in there and I found the little brochure, but it just listed the name, which is Salome, and then the artist, Merton Clavette. Um, and so ultimately then I kept digging to see if I could find somewhere else. Like clearly this painting that caused a stir must have been somewhere else in the newspaper. I couldn't find it in any other papers, um, no other references to it, no references to the stir the previous year. Um, but I could find a lot of stuff about Merton Clavette and he was just fascinating. And the more I read, the more I was just really intrigued. Um, and one of the things I ended up reading was his obituary fairly early on. Um, and he died in 31. So just you know, nine years after this painting is shot and, um, his obituary, it is republished in the book at the end. I actually paid for the privilege of that. Um, <laughs> and it is the best obituary I've ever read, <laughs> which, and I've read a bunch of them because there are interesting sources of information, um, but it just outlines all the things that this guy does. And most of them are in the subtitle there. Um, yeah. I found a web page, which was clavette.com. And I asked them if they had the painting, if they'd ever heard of it, they had never heard of it before. Um, but that really started the collaboration then because I was interested in finding out more about this painting and this guy and they are working on a documentary um, and we're interested in having somebody who is a researcher be connected to their project so they're doing a documentary on his life or 
Yeah. So the brothers I connected with, their last name is Lieber. Um, so their connection is Merton's daughter, uh, Juanita. She's the only offspring of um, Merton and Catherine. Uh, they are, she was their aunt, I think. I think that's the connection. Um, and um, Jason and Chris are both into making movies. Like they're interested in that and they're making, primarily they do kind of shorts. Um, they're 15 to 30 minutes long. Uh, they would love to do a much longer extended documentary about Merton's life. Um, but I don't know that they have the financing for that. So I think the thought is make a short piece that's kind of a calling card, get interest, make it bigger than that. I mean, I, I told them that it should be like a motion picture. Forget about the documentary, like get Nick Cage or Daniel Day-Lewis <laughs> to sport like an amazing mustache. And uh, maybe you could really go all in and kind of experimenting with it because there's so many weird chapters to his life. Absolutely, <laughs> there are. There are so many different <laughs> twists and turns that he takes. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, you know, we know that you've studied Mark Twain extensively. Um, was there anything in your research of Merton Clavet? Uh, his experiences with Mark Twain that surprised you? Because I know their paths crossed at one point. Yeah, their paths cross a couple times. And it's it, it's part of part of the job. And I was we were kind of talking before we started about this, but like part of the job I felt responsible for was reconciling kind of this family story versus whatever truth I could find and figuring out where those overlapped. Or, you know, like I, I think we all have family stories that we tell or we've heard over the years and we don't often go back to documentation to verify whether that was true or not. <laughs> um, and that is definitely the, the case here. So, you know, the story that I read from the family's account was that he knew Mark Twain and that he was the influence for one of Mark Twain's very last books um, called The Mysterious Stranger. And Merton Clavette fits that depiction. I mean, he, in the, in the book, uh, which gets published a couple times after Twain dies. Um, there's different versions of it, but the mysterious stranger is always somebody who's magical, um, who is often a depiction of Satan, um, who you know specializes in the dark arts, yeah. uh, who can kind of tap into spirits and that kind of stuff. And I mean, these are all things that Clavette did on stage. I mean, he was a medium. He, um, in fact, he ends up teaching Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, how to summon spirits, like how you do that thing um, so convincingly that Doyle like believes he's actually magical, even though Clavette tells him repeatedly, like, no, no, I'm, I'm showing you, like, this is how you move stuff under the table. This is how you, <laughs> this is how you make it seem like, like I'm telling you these things, but it, it's just funny to me. But with the, the Twain things, his connections really were, Twain knew Buffalo Bill Cody um, and loved the Wild West show and kind of that nostalgia because Twain had moved out west um, and spent time in San Francisco during the gold rush and time over there uh, with his brother. And then um, Twain was also fascinated um, with the Orpheum circuit, the vaudeville and those kind of performances and um and the circus in general. And so Twain also knew Barnum and he also knew, and I'm, I'm blanking on the guy's name here who did the Orpheum circuit um, of vaudeville, but he knew all three of those people. And I mean, really what happens with little Merton is he's born in Wisconsin. Um, his father dies at age five, five or six. Um, and then his mom moves them to Wyoming, which is a weirdly progressive territory at the time. Women have authority and they can kind of vote in the community things. It's not officially a state, so they don't really have like the vote that way necessarily. Um, but his mom finds a lot of autonomy in Wyoming and um, Merton hangs out there for a bit and then runs away from there um, to join the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, tours around, where then he's introduced to P.T. Barnum where then he tours around the West primarily with P.T. Barnum, and then he ends up joining the Orpheum circuit. So there are several overlaps with Twain. We, I, can, I went back, somebody very studiously recreated all of Twain's t timeline. So like one of the benefits of having somebody 
who we have so much written about is people spend time doing this. So there's this book, I think it's actually four volumes, where it is every day of Twain's life reconstructed. And like this day he went here. And we know this because there's this letter that's dated this and there's this thing over here and this is where he was and this is what he did. Um, and so you can go and I can say like, okay, you know, 1830, 1881, Mark Twain went to P.T. Barnum's circus. Um, we know that at that time, Merton Clavette was performing. He was doing these acts. Um, beyond that, can I say definitively that they talked? No, but the fact that like Twain knows Barnum and we have communications between Barnum and Twain on that day about the show, he probably came up because Clavette was kind of the star of the show at that time. He was doing a lot of the things that then he would make much more popular on the vaudeville circuit. Um, and then we know again, you know, Twain is at the Wild West show when Clavet is there. You know, did they talk then? Probably not then because Clavet was more of a second or an extra. He was sometimes disguised as a young Indian where he got shot at or thrown knives at, which is like... Not great, but, you know, uh, that was part of the show, the performance. shot many times, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, ultimately, we know that Twain knows Houdini, and Clavet and Houdini know each other as well. They're both performing on the same vaudeville circuit. Mm -hmm. They overlap at several dates. Like, it seems like they probably met several times, and whether he is indeed the influence for the mysterious stranger... I don't know, but certainly an inspiration, I would say. Yeah. yeah. All right. So taking a short break from the <laughs> content of the, the book, I'd like to talk a little bit about your writing style. So there's multiple ways you can approach a biography. You chose to write uh, in the first person, and you seem to have a very, um, you have a very good sense of who he was and you convey that sense very clearly in the way that you write. Um, I want to know how you, what your, your relationship with him was like as you were writing, and if you felt the way you ended up de depicting him in the book and, and having his voice, did you feel that that was, where did that come from, essentially? Yeah, thank you, first of all. I'm glad I came across and you enjoyed yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that, that was a struggle. I mean, as a researcher, I want to be as objective as possible, um, but it felt like, the more I got to know Clavette, the the more the less a traditional biography really made sense. Like it didn't seem to bring him to life. And I wrote versions, third person, objective, um, but they were too dry and they didn't really capture his character the way I wanted it to. And I spoke a lot with Chris and Jason and said, you know, essentially I, I wrote three chapters this way and I wrote three chapters this way. Um, here are my arguments either way. Which one do you prefer? And, and ultimately, we came to the decision to the, to the first-person perspective. Um, and it felt pretty good about doing that because Merton was such a collector. Um, I mean, he really kept all of his letters. Um, he wrote journals. He wrote, um, he had, like, scrapbooks where he had clippings or photographs. And then he would have like these snarky little comments in the side where he'd like kind of be pointing at him and be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, <laughs> you know? And, and so like you, I really got a sense of what his voice sounded, you know, probably sounded like. Um, and he also, he also wrote books as well. So he, I mean, just, he did so many things and we had so much to kind of draw from. I felt pretty good about what we were doing was fair and representative. Um, and at the end of the day, like, um, there, there are actually direct passages taken from his letters and journals in there as well. Um, so, you know, we talked about like, well, there's not a better way to say this than the way he actually said it. And so like, we can just use that quote directly. Um, and I, I try to, at the end of the book, really talk about the differences. Like, you know, here are the things, this is why we did what we did. <laughs> and this is, this is how... These are the stretches I made or the logical leaps or whatever. But yeah, um, but yeah I, I feel pretty good about it. So His life is full of ex adventure and excitement and 
crazy times and good times. <laughs> but then there are a couple of uh, parts of his life that are extraordinarily dark, where he loses people that were very po- meaningful to him. And the way that you convey those is very abrupt. And I found it to be in keeping with how he was, almost like he's able to experience his life and different changes that happen and he just rolls with it. Did, was that intentional? Um, you know, for example, the first woman he loved was killed right in front of him by a gunshot to her head and it was really graphic. And he was just like, yeah, and she died and then off we go. Like that was as, as succinct as that happened, it was, but it was a shocking moment. So why did you choose to do that in such a, sure. I don't want to say abrupt because that sounds judgy, but it sounds, it's just, it was a very crisp way to just to describe it. Yeah. Um, a couple, I mean, a couple of thoughts. I mean, he did, you're, I mean, you're right. At that, that time, lots of people died, um, abruptly and suddenly. And it, it, um, it was kind of a, I don't know, it was a different, difficult time to live through, I suppose as well. And his childhood was really challenging. I mean, his father died young. Uh, the part I didn't mention is after his mom moved them to Wyoming she joined the very early days of the Seventh Day Adventists and left them. So then he was raised by his older siblings, um, and they didn't necessarily, they weren't that interested in having a child at that point. Um, and so he was kind of left to fend for himself. And I think he became kind of scrappy and hardened. Um, and so there's that. You know, also I think, you know, when I've when I've talked to people who have lost somebody suddenly. There's, and you want, you know, like as a curious person, I want to know more about everything. Um, But sometimes you don't want to dwell on that, you know? And so I I really, there were very few writings about that first love. And then it really was like, turn the page. Here's this new thing now. Um, And so kind of like the other stuff, I guess it felt the most in keeping with, I don't know, the way he talked about it. Um, and, and, and the way that felt real as well to me. So, yeah. And so as you're researching him, you get access to all of these documents <laughs> and, you know, um, we'd love to hear what it's like having access to documents that have essentially been untouched for a hundred years. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's, it's such a, it really was such a joy to be able to do that. And, um, I, I've worked in archives before, you know, where I've gone there and I've, just dug through boxes of stuff and you never know what's in there. Some people have organized them. Some people haven't, you know, in this case, the the family had done a really good job of scanning almost all of his things. Um, and I would just ask them for stuff and I'd say, do you have this? Or, you know, he, he mentions, he mentions this first love of his, do you have the article that talks about her being shot? And, oh, we don't. Oh, okay. Um, all right, let me see if I can find that. And so, you know, digging through databases, I can find some of those things. Um, but my, my very favorite things that they had were these massive promotional posters that get, are reproduced in the book mm-hmm. of his magic career. You know, when he's doing vaudeville, um, he is, um, I mean, his, he's most famous as a magician and a shadow graphist. And shadow graphists, just shadow puppets. Only he was a headlining act doing shadow puppets on stage in front of people. And I, I just I have such a hard time like wrapping my brain around that. But electric light was relatively new. And you could cast these images on a screen and he would sing and do voices and all of this stuff. Like it was just this big act. So personally, like my very favorite things were seeing these posters, these promotional things, some that he made, some that were made for him. You know, the the cover ends up being part of one of the promotional posters um, that we we kind of manipulated to fit the rest of the title on there. Um, But it it is, um, there's kind of like this joy of, discovery you know when you're given these things that nobody's bothered to look at and and I'll say the family though they were interested in doing the documentary I think sometimes you don't realize what's there when it's always been around you you know like I'm really fortunate with my family um we have really interesting family history as well and we also have done a really good job of keeping a lot of that documentation um 
and so I, I just I don't know I, I love that kind of environment where you get to see these things and hold artifacts you know actually the farmhouse we're staying at right now there are these blueprints for the farm and for the buildings and some of these things it's amazing just to kind of see those things um so you know in terms of clavette i guess specifically um i don't know it was, it was just it was so much fun <laughs> so my last question for you is it's funny right in keeping with what you're describing the parallels between you and and he in fact because i find you both to be extremely curious people but you've also <laughs> explored dozens of professions um you know Merton Clavette was everything from an artist to a hypnotist and a lecturer to a knife juggler. And you've done everything from be a grant writer to a pizza delivery driver, <laughs> an art student to a roadie for a country band. Uh, do you think your mutual love for life's diverse experiences drew you to him even further? I think so. Yeah, I mean, when, I mean, those are the kind of projects that attract you, I think, you know, when you see a little bit of yourself in there. Um, and yeah, I, that, um, I mean, really, I guess, kind of thinking about the inspirations for writing the book and doing the project in the first place were, one, it really felt like this disservice that this person who is so interesting has just kind of disappeared. Um, and it really feels like in 1931, when he died, his legacy just kind of disappeared. Um, and that's just really sad. Um, and then the other part, you know, is just like, holy crap, he did so many things. And it's amazing to think of being in a position where you can reinvent yourself so many times and be successful. Um, you know, I mean, thank you for my, my list of acc accolades, but like pizza <laughs> delivery does not match up with knife juggling um, at all, you know? And, um, you know, it's, it's funny to think, you know, he, he could have probably continued as a magician for as long as he wanted. I mean, he performed for the, the king and queen of England because he um, straddled that line where, when succession transferred. Um, you know, he performed in India. Like, he traveled the world doing these things and then decides that he'd like to have a family. And if you're going to have a family, then, like, you should probably find something that doesn't require travel as much. And so he settles down in Greenwich Village and then becomes a world famous painter. Like, I don't even understand how that happens, you know? And, you know, you, it's, um, he ends up being one of the only Americans to have a solo exhibit in Paris in the 20s, 1920s. And I mean, he's talked about, he sells thousands of paintings during his lifetime. So he's one of those rare people who ends up being able to make a living as a living artist, which was so rare at the time. And there's so few people who benefit from being able to sell paintings when they're living. You know, they go up in Valley afterwards. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, to answer your question about parallels, I mean, I, I admire that. Um, and my, you know, my curiosity definitely drives me in interesting paths and, I always like learning things. Um, you know, I think thinking about him on the on the vaudeville circuit, the, the Orpheum circuit, the Orpheum circuit went around west of Chicago. So anything west of Chicago was Orpheum and then the east of Chicago, essentially New York. I can't remember what that one was, but there are two rival circuits um, that basically had vaudeville. And um, the benefit of the one on the Orpheum side was they paid you a wage. So instead of just paying you for a performance, if you were on the Orpheum circuit, you got paid a daily wage. Um, and so that meant when you were traveling, you were getting paid to do nothing. And I think, I mean, for everything I can tell, while he was on the train, he just learned all of the things that everybody else did on the vaudeville circuit. He's like, oh, you know this? Okay, teach me that. You know, look, I'd like to learn sleight of hand. I'd like to learn you know, how you do these certain things. Um, and, you know, so I think boredom kind of forced him to kind of do that kind of thing. Um, but, but also that, that curiosity and just kind of interest um, as well. So, but. Well, it's a wonderful book. It's a fun read. It's a great ride through his life. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Thanks for the chat. Did you guys have any questions? He just had the one daughter. Yep, Juanita. Um, so they settled down in like 1901 in Greenwich Village, and his wife Catherine and him, they had a daughter, Juanita. Um, and she, I think she died in the early 80s, 1980s. Um, so yeah, just the one child. Did he have grandchildren then? Yeah, but none that he lived to see. He died in 31, so um, I don't think. I think Juanita was was married shortly after that, actually. Um, Catherine, his his wife, was a performer all on her own uh, right as well. I mean, I really didn't spend a lot of time with Catherine because the family doesn't have a whole lot on her. Um, but she also was a performer. Um, she did acrobats and um, um, like balance beam kind of things. Like that was more her thing that she did. Um, but she also performed with him as a part of his mag magic show, as part of his shadow graphy. Like they were, they were really partners in crime. Um, and then um, when she got to Greenwich Village, she kind of did her own thing. I mean, she, she actually established the first historical society for Greenwich Village um, and um, did uh, like, her work was going around and trying to reclaim history as well. So she found places where Thomas Paine did, um, you know, where he talked or shared, what was it, Common Sense, I think was his, his work. Um, and so there's a plaque in Greenwich Village and that was established by Catherine's Greenwich Village Historical Society. Um, you know, and she did things for Edgar Allan Poe to try to reclaim his legacy because he had kind of, disappeared at that point and people weren't reading his stories as much or thinking about him but he was definitely part of that community and um, so Juanita grows up kind of in that Greenwich Village which was very much a um, artistic kind of mixing pot of cultures as well lots of lots of different immigrants kind of settling in there um, and musicians and artists and Clavette and Catherine were kind of the parents of that area. They were older than a lot of the people living in the area. And so people would come to his little shop, which I didn't even really talk about, but it's called um, Soul One. And it was like the curiosity shop um, where he sold his books, he sold his paintings. You could come watch him paint and sculpt and that kind of stuff if you wanted to. It was a little of everything. Um, all his. All his, yeah. I, and he sold some stuff for local people there too, but it was primarily his things. Um, and that, that actually was demolished shortly. Like they lived there for like five, eh, seven or eight years. And it was demolished shortly after it was shot actually. So the, the shooting of the painting that we started the conversation with, um, actually, um, that's, that's the shop then, uh, that then gets demolished, but then they live again. They established a new place in Greenwich village and, um, remain there for quite a while. So. Um, but yeah, to answer your question very directly, one child <laughs> named Juanita, she's super interesting in her own right, um, but um, claimed to be reincarnated and wrote poetry and um, so, yeah. Now, what about like, did you, were you able to follow her children, grandchildren for him or any of that beyond? I kind of... you mentioned... Yeah, no, I, I really stopped with Clavette's death in 31. So when he dies in 1931, that, that's essentially where the book really ends. Um, I, I told them I'd love to write another volume because I do think Bonita's super interesting. Um, it's, it's funny, though, since since the book came out, I actually was um, approached. There's a person in Toronto who is actually publishing a book of Juanita's poetry. Um, and so he wanted, he like, he just was like, it just so happens I'm, I'm putting a book about Juanita's poetry. And like, I saw that you had a book out. And so he bought a copy of the book and he's going to send me a copy of the Juanita po poetry when that's done as well. And uh, there was actually a, a reporter just the other day who was interested in Juanita's story too. So it may came out independent of me for, for all I know. But, yeah. yeah. But somehow you were able to track some relatives, but they were not 
through his own daughter. Oh, they, they, I'm sorry. Yes. They so they, they were, what, Winita's, Win, Winita is their aunt or great aunt. Right. So Chris, Chris and aunt, Jason. Not his direct line of children. Great grandchildren would be they Chris and great. Jason. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Were there any stories that you couldn't fit in the book just because there were enough time? <laughs> or do you have a favorite story that you weren't able to include for whatever reason? Many reasons, I'm sure. There, there were a bunch that I couldn't include because they I couldn't verify them. Okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean, my, my favorite story is, and, and I, I, I mentioned this because then I'm able to correct it, um, but. For the longest time, he claimed to be 20 years older than he actually was. So he grew a mustache, um, and that was enough, apparently, to convince people that he was 20 years older. Um, and his story was that he was born on the Indian Ocean, so he had no country of origin. He was in international waters, um, and it was 1848. And then... Um, you know, and he tells this whole story about being raised in India for a time before he comes over here. And that's why he has all these mystical arts and all that stuff. Um, and the, the truth is he's born in 1868, 20 years later in Wisconsin. Um, his father was a, a na was in the Navy. So it's possible his father saw the Indian Ocean. Um, maybe was on a ship in 1848. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, there, there are lots of stories like that that are that are kind of funny. And it, actually, one of my favorite things, I think, then is although almost every single obituary. So, sorry, slight diversion. But at the time, you know, most newspapers didn't write their own obituaries. They would get one obituary from a central place and then they would just publish it. But he was such a weird character and he was present in so many different states that almost every newspaper wrote their own obituary for him. Um, and they all included different details. So, which was great as a researcher, because I was like, oh, okay, I can, I can pull from these different things. Here's an overlap. I can verify these things happen. Um, but almost every single one of them comments on how shocked they were to learn that he was only 62 <laughs> because he was selling himself as an 80 year old painter. Up, up until the time of his death. And then it feels like there's almost this deathbed confession where he's like, okay, I got to set the record straight. Because he, he does learn that he has, I mean, probably was some form of cancer. We're not really sure exactly what it was. Um, but he learns that his condition is terminal. And it really feels like in that last year of his life that he attempts to correct all of these things that he has boasted, lied about um, over time. So... Um, you lie about them in the journals? I mean, is that where you got that the, the journals, as far as I can tell, are pretty straight. So, it, I mean, that was the most jarring thing where I figured out, like, okay, this is all boast and promotion because you'd have the you'd have the poster advertising 80-year-old paint, octog, octogenarian <laughs> painter, right? And then in his journal, you know, he would be writing about turning 61 years old. <laughs> and I'm like this doesn't even make any sense. Like, it, you know, it, it's kind of like the accounting firm that keeps two books, you know? <laughs> that's, that's your volume two. Yeah. The uh, boastful and uh, <laughs> stories that you can't confirm. Right. In some ways, it yeah. felt like, to me, the modern social media. Like, he put a bunch of oh. stuff out that people oh, yeah. wanted people to see and think about, right? And then created their perception. And then there's this sort of more private version of himself. <laughs> And, and just, too, with, like, the number of photos and documentations and, and different different things, like, in some ways, it, it, that life felt such like what our kids experience when they are out there on social media and their whole lives are documented in this way, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, there are so many weird overlaps. I mean, that, that was, I, I honestly, I don't remember why I started reading the newspapers from 100 years ago, but it, <laughs> what, what was it? I don't. I don't know the thing that I, 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 Well, you can verify it. I think I know. So I think you got tired of the political stuff. The political mm. stuff was really stressful for you. And you wanted something that felt just different and got you out of what was happening 
in the here and now, and I think you started picking up stuff from 100 years ago, but then jarringly found that there was a lot of overlap from 100 years ago to the present, and that got your, your curiosity brain going. That was my memory of how that happened. I, that sounds fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I like reading things, and, so it, and I like reading newspapers. I, I enjoy that kind of format of storytelling. You and obituaries you put a lot of those newspaper articles online. Yeah. yeah, I do like sharing them. Sometimes they're just so, I don't know, they're, they're just written in such a unique style that you just don't get these days. But um, yeah, I mean, that was that was the most jarring thing is how many overlaps there were then. You know, like, I mean, even starting with the painting being shot. At that very time I was reading that, there were all the climate activists attacking paintings in museums, like now. And it was, it was like, my gosh, like this painting gets shot because it offends somebody. This one's, you know, being, um, I don't know, they were like splattering with food or chaining themselves to it or spray painting um, as a way of raising awareness. Different goal, but it was weird that painting was kind of that, um, I don't know, that, that vessel. Um, but then... You know, the vandals and the bandits, at the same time, there were kind of these riots and protests, and then there were, you know, they're just all of these weird parallels that just kind of echoed over a hundred years, so, mm -hmm. but. I wanted to ask one other follow-up on that age difference. About how old was he when he started suggesting he was 20 years older? 14. Was, I was going to say, 15. Yeah. So, so at 14, he was telling everyone he's yeah. 34. So <laughs> you would, you, would you pass for 34? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you need, need a mustache. About that yet. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I was thinking about that in the times and why you would do something like that. And I'm thinking it's because you want to portray yourself with some experience. A 14-year-old trying to sell himself isn't going to do a good job. But if I've had 20 years of experience doing this, you yeah, know, or some more protection. He was right? abandoned, yeah. so he right? had to come up with yeah. a way to I mean, have credibility. So kind of a, but you're more vulnerable at 14, too. So if you yeah, say you're 24 or 34, you're less yeah. likely to get it's like trying with. to get alcohol or something. You know, yeah. When you're younger, you kind of have well, a certain... I mean, he grew a mustache, and then he told everybody that he was a small Frenchman. So... <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, was exotic. So it worked. <laughs> When are you going to start your book on the Krauss I definitely am thinking about that for sure. I know I know that Dean has done a lot of research. So I, my cousin Dean is and his wife um, Lori are kind of the family archivists in some ways. So, genealogists. Genealogists, yeah. 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 And um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think that story is super interesting too. Yeah. So in, in that case, he's my two greats, right? Great great-grandfather and he um i mean he did all kinds of interesting things my very favorite thing that he did was the giving the gift of livestock so i will give i will give to a farmer animals and then when they reproduce give me one back so i can then redistribute them uh, around a small farm community um and the whole idea of just being able to like bring the arts to a small community um, giving them a music hall and, you know, a theater before library. they, yeah, a library before, like, usually it follows the trajectory of small town turns into industrialized thing that grows to this and then acquires the arts. Third largest reading center in the country. Yeah. So that is definitely on my mind. <laughs> was a canning kitchen and, I mean, mattress, making mattresses and things that they couldn't afford. Yeah. Don't worry, my, my wheels are turning on that. Wait, on the Yeah. 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 Well, thank you guys so much.